we have uh, we have an announcement for you all so the announcement goes group discussion starts at 18:30 ist in de shaw india booth number 1 I have gave a thought on whether we should have python as the first language to be taught in universities and colleges if not this is the time to think and share your views we look forward to some interesting discussion here and of course there are some exciting prizes up for grab mm, that's that's amazing thanks to isha for that so feel free to check out julep if you go to the announcement channel you'll find a link to wherever the booth is on hopin or you can check the booth on hopin itself if you want to and there are some forms to be filled if you want to grab those gifts and prizes so go to zulip announcement channel you'll find a link to the registration form you'll find the link to the booth as well now moving on to pavel hey pavel can you hear me hello hey i can hear you clearly so i'm just going to share your screen now and the stage is all yours okay hello my name is pavel polevich and today i'm going to speak about library interfaces changing over time let's begin first thing upgrades can be painful but for developers those are often worse than for regular users I'm going to tell you a story about the Debian server upgrade that I took part of in 2006. After upgrading the operating system version, all services were fine except one, FTP. It accepted connections but refused to transfer files. This FTP was the only way for us to put new music on a streaming server of the largest e-radio station on the planet at that time. So we had to get it up. First, we tried uh, the init script, just stop it with an init script, but it didn't do nothing. So, but you know, init scripts, they, they sometimes have bugs. Sometimes they rely on PID files that are not there. So I thought, okay, this is not working. Let's list the process list, find the, the FTP process, send it to kill. So that's what we did, but it didn't work either. So we thought more. Okay, okay. So what, what else can we do? Kill means nine. Sick kill. Um, so we sent that, but uh, amazingly, it did still not uh, kill the process. Port 21 was still accepting connections, not transferring files. You were kind of puzzled. But then one of the admins has remembered that there is a command that can kill every process. It was kill all pi. He invoked the command without any parameters to see what the proper syntax is. Because, you know, most commands, if you if you just type the command name, it was an uh, error, missing argument. But uh, then his terminal froze. No help was uh, displayed. And that happened because kill five does not accept any arguments. It kills all the processes in the system. Every service died, uh, including SSH. We couldn't log in anymore. Uh, the stream switched to, to the backup server. And there was no KVM, so we couldn't connect to that server either uh, by that. But even after this, the port 21 was still accepting connections. So we had to call the data center, ask them to press the physical button on the machine to reboot it. When I think about that story, I smile. It was fun, but not all version upgrade stories are that funny. Non-backward compatible changes are a major issue with long-term support. Maybe young startups don't feel it that much, but successful projects eventually have to upgrade their dependencies. Startups that take a longer time to get to the market are impacted most by this because their stack is getting old and they still have very limited resources. Hobby projects. 
the ones that are closest to our hearts, on our free time, those are hit the hardest because there's almost no resources and dependencies are changing their version and you have to follow them. Otherwise your project just doesn't work. The interface changes in the libraries eventually force the application developers to adapt their code to work with the new API. So for them, it would be best to never have any non-backward compatible changes. The thing shown on the screen is the most famous adapter in the world on board of Apollo 13. I want us as a community to make less of those. The thing is, if a library has 200 users, a non-backward compatible change will eventually force all of those users to go over the change log and adapt their code to the new interface. But most of this effort is hid hidden from the library maintainer. While hundreds of engineers try to migrate their applications over to the new interface, the library maintainer already works on new features and next changes. So there is a great disparity between the effort that the community needs to make to follow the version and the amount of work that this developer can do to, to increase the major server to release a new non-compatible version. Both users and maintainers face the same problem from different sides. Maintainers want to improve their interface for the new users. The old users would like to keep their applications running so they don't want the interface to change. Meanwhile, new users want a new a new modern nice API, but as soon as they start using it, they want stability. They become old users and they don't want the interface to change anymore. Users also generally want access to new features, performance and maintainability improvements, even after they settle for an interface version. So library maintainers need to introduce non-backward compatible changes to their APIs to improve them. But then eventually, application developers have to follow those changes in order to receive security updates and support because the maintainer will not keep maintaining the old versions, old branches of the library and fixing bugs on all of them. Eventually, the support is going to be dropped. Version 2 will have zero users on the first day, regardless of popularity of version 1, because nobody can adapt their code yet. And there seems that there is no other way. But maybe there is. Turns out there might be a way. Actually, I think it's not that hard. I called the abstraction of the interface, which solves this problem, Appiver, because it assumes that the API of the library will have different versions. Here is how it looks for the user. Now, this is how we previously imported uh, code. So there is the internal structure of the library is exposed a little bit, and then the user needs to know this to import a function. And this is the new way that I propose. So the obvious question here is, what about namespaces? So it is unlikely that you really need them. If you even have two uh, file classes in different modules that do different things, you might want to change their names a little bit so that's less confusing. Alternatively, just do this and um, keep a little bit of your external structure, uh, of your internal structure in the interface. Mm, I realized that uh, my library is like medium size and it can be flattened to a, to a simple namespace easily. Mm. The important part is that V2 which gives you back 
your freedom. If you use API Ver, you can move your code around as much as you want, really, because users won't mind. In fact, most of them won't even know that something happened. Imagine what your users would think if you'd like to rearrange modules so that the structure is slightly more consistent. There's no functional change to it, but it looks more tidy for you. But then sometime later, you decide something between the old system and the current system would be even better, and you change it again. Everybody would have to fix their imports and then fix them, their imports again. So you're creating a lot of work for all of your users. You break compatibility for them for no functional change. If you use Appiver, you are free to change your internal structure without impacting the users. Okay, so how, how does the implementation look like? How do, how do we do this? Well, it turns out it's not expensive. It's one line per public member on the, uh, of the interface. So function, class, or constant. That's all it takes. See for yourself. Mm, the newest version imports from your internal structure. So this is version 2. And it's imports from, uh, from the structure that you had before. The imports seem similar to how we used to import before Appiver. And the old version, version 1, imports from second version. So, so this one init file is the adapter that bridges the gap between version 1 and version 2 changes. The older versions import from the one above them. Version 1 imports from version 2, version 2 imports from version 3, and so on. So you only need to focus on one adapter at a time to cover the API differences between the last release and your current pull request. OK. So that's moving. But how about renaming a function or a class? Let's do that. Version 3 is, again, one line. In fact, it's the same uh, line that you used to have in version 2, because it's a top version, except it now imports a rename function. And users of version 3 will call the function by its new name, by rename function while users of version 2 will call the function the same name as they used to call it, and it will still work for them. And the adapter for version 2 here is just one line. No need to release a new major version. No need to adjust code for all the users. Just works. OK, how about adding a new mandatory argument? So here we assume that version 4 needs to explicitly provide the value, and version 3 uses a default. It's up to the developer to decide if the style keyword argument should be available for version 3 users. Here, there seems to be no benefit in hiding it. The alternative is to do this. So you just you don't expose it in the version 3 interface, uh, so they can't define the style, but, um, but it is defined for them. OK, so in version 2, we have moved the code around. In version 3, we have renamed functions. In version 4, we have added mandatory arguments. Now imagine that we would also refactor portions of the code, keeping the same interface in version 4. But then we would fix an old bug. So if we had different versions of the code on different branches. We would not be using Appiver. We would have to backport the fix through code movement, renaming, and refactoring. And that requires more and work more, more and more work from the maintainer the farther we go into the past. That is the reason why people cut off support. But then, some bug needs to be fixed in different implementations, pre-refactor and post-refactor. So you're doing the same thing twice. And it is wasteful. 
if you're using Apivert, the fixing of the top version is enough. And also there is no need to drop support for the old versions because there are no old versions. No need to force folks using the old versions to adjust your code, just works. Okay, so that's all good, but there can be some issues. So these are the ones that I found. Some wrappers may be hard to write. If you change a lot in your interface, and the, that means the users would have to adapt their code. So either everyone implements their own adapter or they change their code, which is even more work. So we can do this 200 times across the entire community, right? Or we can do this in one place in the library itself. The cost is way lower, but the other person bears the cost. So that's a little bit of a problem. I have to say that if you are the person that is breaking the compatibility, you know the old interface, you know the new interface, you have all the code in your memory, and you're making that change. So creating an adapter for you is quite easy. Creating an adapter for someone else that just installed your library three years ago and has no understanding about the internals is way more difficult. So it's not like it's 200 times easier for you to do that. It's even more. Some tooling would be nice. We can probably manage things better. We can add decorators to indicate the, in the documentation that the given method is going to be phased out in the future. Um, but not future major release, but future happy release. We can automatically list the differences between the interface versions and so on. That tooling is not here yet. We can make and uh, if you think, if you don't think about your interface, which methods and, and functions should be public and constants and oops, and, and uh, you are all ready above version one, then you may want to cut down the interface to what should actually be public in a major sample release before adopting Appiver. Because supporting internal infrastructure with uh, wrappers is just not necessary. Nobody will ever use those uh, wrappers, but you don't really know because you don't know which methods are public and which are private. Defining the interface surface is important in Semver. Not all people do that. That's, that's a good moment to do it. Okay, so what's next? You already know how not to use your internal module structure as a library interface. Just create one file which exposes the flat interface, preferably flat, and let people use that. So if you start using Appiver, you, you can start using it now, but you probably learn something and please share that learning with me so that we can make it better. And uh, yeah, I'm sure it can be improved, but for that, we need to start using it and uh, we have to talk. Is there a short summary? This is how it looks for the user. This is how you implement something, right? The, the, the wrapper. So just create an init file and, uh, and take from the higher one or from the um, if you're on the top version, just, just import from your internal structure. And benefit that you get from that is freedom to do whatever you want with, with your internal structure of the code without messing everything up for uh, all of your users. And uh, on version two, you don't have an empty room problem where you just release the second version, but nobody can use it because they already use the old version and they don't really have time to modify their code on your schedule. Thank you. Let's talk during the break and... Um... Thanks, Fabian. Like great. To... Oh, yeah. So uh, uh, let me finish. If you'd like okay. to discuss this subject with me further or any other Python backend subject for that matter, 
find me during the break in the hallway, um, which Bill Tim Shanky will mention in a moment. And here's my email if you want to write to me. Uh, finally, many thanks to the organizers of the conference for letting me share this. I hope it will make the world a slightly tiny little better place than it used to be. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Pavel. We have one okay. question. Would you like to take that right now? Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So the question sure. goes, does that mean when we implement the 10th version of a library, we have to include 9th, 8th, 7th version in the BIP package? Wouldn't that increase the size of the package a lot? Um, OK. That, that's a very good question. So you don't include the entire code base of it. You only include the top version and wrappers for the old versions. But those are only one file that has one line per interface member. So it's extremely light. And pip also zips it. And most of it is going to be import statements. And uh, zip eats those pretty well. So maybe the package will become a little bit bigger. But you shouldn't even notice it. Like I, I don't think it's a major concern. The storage cost now is very small, and it takes you a tiny little bit fraction of the cent to to store this forever. So, kind of yes, but it's not a really big problem. Okay. Any other questions? Anyway, um, let's let's go to the hallway maybe to discuss this in video. We actually have a video chat on Hopin that we can all go into and, and discuss it on, on video. Sure. So I have this second draw. Yeah, so I have this uh hallway track. Mm, as you can see, we have a lot of hallway tracks which are completely free to join and okay. uh, one of the holiday tracks, which is Mercury, is completely free right now. And we can um, invite we invite all the attendees who are watching right now. If you have any questions, if you want to communicate with Pavel after the session, feel free to join Mercury hallway track and uh, ask your questions or uh, have a conversation, talk more about yeah, how you can do it. It's a bad idea. If it's a bad idea, please come and tell me. If it's a good <laughs> idea, please come and tell me. <laughs> Got it. So I'm sure you'll find a lot of uh, questions there. And thanks a lot, Pavel. Thanks a lot. We see you on the hallway track now. OK. And, uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. See you there. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. OK, so major announcement after this session is that we are going to have our keynote um, speaker on the Bangalore stage. So Naomi Seda will be joining us. She'll be giving a keynote session at 7 uh, p.m. IST, that is 19.00. And it is going to start in just three minutes. So if you want to check out that keynote session, please head towards Bangalore stage. Uh, so we are going to stop the Delhi stage stream right now. Feel free to head towards the Bangalore stage. You'll find the that uh, session running on the stages. Click on Bangalore and you'll be in. OK, thanks a lot, everyone, for joining on day one on Delhi stage. And uh, see you tomorrow. Sure. Share your feedbacks or questions uh, in the comments on Hopping Chat. Tweet about the session. Tag at the PyCon India. Hashtag at the PyCon India 2020. And uh, yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.